Welcome, everybody. I'm Reverend Linda Tice, and I'm so glad that we are gathered together and worshiping together. For our friends at home, I'm so glad that you are with us as well. This is a great day to praise God. Amen. I have a few announcements I want to share with you. Um, Lent is coming. It seems like we just finished Christmas, doesn't it? Uh, but Lent begins uh, Valentine's Day. It's real easy to remember this year. So Ash Wednesday is Valentine's Day. But one of the things that we want to do this Lent is have some, some focused small groups and focused studies going on during Lent. And one of, um, one of them will be called The Third Day. It's uh, written by our bishop, Tom Berlin, and it's a really good study about what does the resurrection mean for us, really. And so we are going to be having various groups at different times during the week that will be studying this book, The Third Day. And I will also be preaching off of The Third Day for my Lenten sermon series. And so um, you'll be hearing a lot more about that, but... If you're interested in being in a small group, we'll have them at various times during the week. We do need to go ahead and order the book. So if you are interested in either doing this book personally, reading it, or to be part of a group, would you please... Um, Either call, if you're at home, you can call the church office and order a book or um, sign up outside and let us know that you would like a book because um, we do need to go ahead and get those orders so that they are here in time. Also, Kay and Dave Cordy have done a book that they really like called Simon Peter, and they would like during Lent to um, lead a group on this book as well. And so they're looking for either a Sunday afternoon group or a Thursday afternoon group. So if you are interested, you decide, no, I don't really want to do the third day, or I'm doing that somewhere else, I'd like to do something different. We have this group as well. You don't need to buy a book. We have books for that. Uh, you just need to come and enjoy the conversation. But um, you can sign up outside and let us know if you're interested in being that group and which day would be more preferable for you. So we've got some great things coming with Lent. and We really want to be intentional this Lent about entering into this idea of who Jesus is for us. And so I ask you to take a look at those things and, and uh, look at them. And we will also, um, one thing I also want to draw to your attention in the announcements is February 10th. Uh, the women are sponsoring a potluck here at the church. It's Saturday at noon, and this is for church, uh, everybody in the church. And I really would invite you to come and be a part of this. Um, one of my friends, Anne, is coming, and she is going to talk about uh, a ministry called Zoe Empowers that we really are very interested in as a church becoming involved in. So you can hear about that. Come and have some fellowship and fun with your um, church family and uh, but you'll look for more information but mark that February 10th on your calendar I am so glad that we are all here today I'm glad that you are joining us at home and let's stand and join our hearts together and voices as we join in our opening song Greater than all we seek, greater than all we ask, 
with us. God is on our side. He will make a way. Far above all we know, far above all we hope, He has done great things. Lifted up. God is with us, He will go before, He will never leave us, He will never leave us, God is for us, He has open arms, He will never fail us, He will never fail us, lift it up, He defeated the grave, brings to life. Speaking of God being able, I just want you to take note of Pastor Linda. Did you have knee surgery here? Knee replacement surgery? And she's standing up. God is truly able, isn't he? So let's keep her in our prayers throughout the week because our God is able. This next song is called Your Love, O Lord. You guys, I make this, uh, I use this song as a prayer all the time. Take a look at the words if you can. I'll just read it for you. It says, I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. For your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. When we sing on that today, let's make this a prayer to the Lord. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky.
Please be seated. Isn't that a great image? The image of God's wings over us, protecting us, drawing us close, loving us. Gosh, what does that feel like? What does that feel like knowing that God is there around you, protecting you, loving you, caring for you. It's a great image, isn't it, to remind us that God is with us even when we turn away. God is with us. As we pray today, I invite you again, we started it last week, but during the prayer at my invitation to have a time where, where you lift up the names or names of people who are on your heart, who you bring with you into worship that you're worried about, concerned about, praying for and that we just lift their names out loud up to God. God doesn't need any other explanation, but we share those with God. And maybe today, maybe today you lift up your name. Maybe today is a really rough day, a day that you're feeling lonely or scared and you just need God I need to be reminded that you see me. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, oh, what a gift that you are there. You are with us every step of our lives, loving us, caring for us, protecting us, and even when it feels like we are alone, you are there guiding situations around us, bringing people into our lives, sharing words that maybe we need to hear, be reminded of. Or maybe, Lord, you're calling us to be that person for someone else, to be that person that shows care, and the love of God. That you share a few words God has placed on your heart for them. Maybe they're just the right words that they need to hear today. Oh Lord, you call all of us to, to live out our faith. It's not just a passive faith where we just receive and receive but it is a faith that changes our lives. Being a follower of Jesus, Lord, is, not, is one of action, of transformation. Give us courage, Lord. Give us courage to be those people. Courage to be your followers that go out and in word and deed make a difference, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your gift of grace, of grace and mercy, of how you forgive us for the many, many times we mess up, because we mess up a lot, Lord, over and over again, but yet your mercy is there and your compassion for us. Help us, Lord, when we say we're sorry to, to really mean it and give us the courage to try to do differently, to change, 
the ways that we hurt others or hurt you. And Lord, as we gather here today, whether here or at home, we're thankful for times where we intentionally turn to you and say, this is your time, Lord. Help us to make that time at other times during the week where we put you first. And Lord, as we come before you today, we come with people on our hearts and minds, people that we are worried about, people that we're praying for, or maybe ourselves. And at this moment of silence, we lift their voices, their names up to you out loud. Hear our voices, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit bring healing and wholeness to those we have lifted up. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray that we here at Trinity can be a community that shares compassion and mercy to all. We pray that we have the courage to, to be your people, to take action in ways that may seem uncomfortable but yet to be your people. So fill us, Lord, with your presence, with your courage, your strength. We love you, Lord. And it is in that love and the wit that we, we join our voices together everywhere to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How many of you guys live a charmed life? Everything goes right, all your plans come exactly how you thought they would. And it's driven you right to church, right? Right into the arms of the loving God, right? No, we're gonna we're gonna sing this next song. I want to read the second verse for you a little bit. It says, I have plans. Shattered and broken, things I have hoped in fall through my hands. But you have plans to redeem and restore me. You're behind and before me. Oh, help me believe. So let's give God the control today.
Would you pray for me as I pray for you? Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. Open our hearts and our minds to hear the particular message that you have for each of us today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I say are not my own, but are yours. Amen. Aren't those words that we just sang true? God doesn't need us, but yet God wants us. It's a little daunting to think about it. Well, today I'm going to talk about somebody that that sort of applies to. I'm going to tell you today about the worst sermon ever. The worst sermon ever in the Bible. Now, y'all listen to a lot of people through your lives. You've heard a lot of sermons. You've heard a lot of preachers. And if I asked you what makes for a good sermon, you probably could give me a list of a few things, right? Well, I want to talk to you about this worst sermon. But before I can do that, I need to talk about the prophets a little bit in the Bible. What is a prophet? Prophets were people called by God for a specific reason. And they, for the most part, were just regular people. Shepherds, tax collector, whoever. They were normal people. They weren't necessarily priests and people who were trained to be a prophet. They didn't go to Prophet 101 in school. They were just regular people. And yet, God called them for a very specific reason, a very specific task that needed to be talked about in various different situations. Now, when you talk about the prophets in the Bible, you talk about the major prophets. Major prophets were um, Isaiah, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Some of the bigger, you can find the the major prophet in um, those books. The major prophets are people where a good part of their life was taken up with this idea of being a prophet. But most of the prophets were smaller prophets. 
They were people that just were called for a, a certain moment, a certain situation, a certain time in their life. And then the rest of their life we know nothing about. We just assume that they went back to doing whatever it was that they had done beforehand. Some of the minor prophets that we call them would be people like Amos, Obadiah, um, Micah. Um, and we are going to talk today about one of them, Jonah. Now you're thinking, we've talked about Jonah. You've preached on Jonah. And I have. But I want to talk about the last part of the book of Jonah. We've talked a lot about Jonah. Everybody's familiar with the story of Jonah, right? What happened? We know that um, the facts that we know about Jonah uh, is a familiar one. We know that Jonah is the son of Amatea, and the, we know that from 2 Kings. He lived in the vicinity of Galilee, basically, and during the 8th century, during the reign of King Jeroboam. Those are the facts that we know about. And we know that God wanted Noah to go to the city of Nineveh, which is in a, a, a Syrian um, country. It is the big city, maybe the capital, whatever you want to call it, that's in Assyrian. Assyrian is the bad people of the Bible. They are the country that are, they don't treat people very nicely. They have overtaken many countries. You'll see throughout the Bible, the Assyrians were, that people were conquered by the Assyrians. They were overthrown, oppressed. We hear about the Syrians in this negative light a lot. And they were considered fairly brutal people. So here we have, at the beginning of the book of Jonah, we have God telling Jonah, I want you to go east and talk to the people. And then so, did, so Jonah said, okay, and got on a boat and went what direction? West. Disobeyed God, said, nope, uh, not doing that. The boat got into a storm, uh, Jonah told them, throw me overboard, I'm the reason for the storm, if you want to survive, throw me overboard, they finally did, he was swallowed by what, a big whale or fish, and spent three days in the belly of the whale, and that's probably three good days to really think about it, right, and he repented and said, okay, Lord, got vomited up on shore, and that's where we pick up our story. Because one of the things that we learn about God, I hope you've learned about God so far, is that God can be very persistent. When God needs something done or wants something, God can be very persistent. Have you found that true in your life? Have you found that true? So I am, we are going to focus on the third and fourth chapter of the book of Jonah. And I begin reading in third chapter, the first verse. He has now been spit up on the, on the shore. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. I want you to picture Jonah for a minute. He doesn't want to be there. Can you imagine that journey getting to Nineveh? It doesn't tell us how long it took him to get there. I can imagine that he dilly-dallied around, sort of kept distracting himself with things. It took him a while to get to Nineveh as he dragged his feet. And then he's finally at the city, 
in this country. He can't stand people he doesn't like. And it says it's a big city, so it takes three days to get across. Well, he's just in his first day. He hasn't even gone into the heart of the city. And the heart of the city is really where the town center is, where if people want to make proclamations, want to be heard. You know, it's like most cities. You go to the center of the city, the, the city hall, the place where people are at, to really make your important announcements. So picture Jonah. He is going along, dragging his feet, grumbling, complaining as he's walking through the city. And he's only in the first day, so he's still on the outskirts of the city. And he finally can't stand it anymore. And he gives his sermon. All right? And his sermon is eight short words. And he says to the people, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was a sermon. Amen. No nice little story to warm people up. No way of connecting to people what's going on. No ne simple nothing. Eight words. Nineveh will be overthrown in 40 days. Hmm. Wow. What would you do with that if you were people that heard this man just stopping? Who knows where he stopped? Outside of a 7-Eleven, outside of a stable? Who knows? It's just like he was walking and he couldn't hold it anymore. He couldn't stand it anymore. And he had to just blurt it out and get it out and say, okay, I've done it. I did what you told me, Lord. I gave them the message. I'm done. Can't you sort of picture that a little bit? Forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. Why was Jonah so reluctant to be in Nineveh? To go and to tell people these, this word of God? You know, bottom line, he didn't want to give them help. He didn't like the Syrians. He didn't like them at all. And he knew that God, if he was to give them a message from God, he was going to be helping them. He didn't want to give them this warning, this message of help from God. He tried to make it the worst sermon ever. He just was, I've done it. Here it is. But you know what? We know that God used that worst sermon ever to bring about change. It was one of the most effective sermons in the Bible. How do we know that? Verse 5, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Sackcloth is a ceremonial cloth that's put on. It's a symbol of repentance. And so it lets us know that all of them heard the word, and re wanted to repent, to see their actions. And it continues on in that chapter where the word got to the king, the king heard about it, rented his own clothes, put on sackcloth, and put out a proclamation to the whole, to the whole um, country that everybody was to be in repentance and to not eat, to fast, even, he says, even the animals, every living creature is to be part of this repentance, this fasting, and turning to God. 
says, who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is the king setting out a national day of repentance. And then we have verse 10. God, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. It did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Hmm. Well, I got to tell you, there's some good news in this for preachers. And that is in spite of ourselves, no matter how bad our sermons are, and there are many times all preachers walk away going, oh my gosh, that was the worst ever. We have learned God still can use our words. When I pray and that I pray that it be your words, God, not mine, that the Holy Spirit touches words and touches hearing, because I've had people that will hear things that they needed to hear in a sermon that I would immediately want it to burn. God used words. And here again, God used a sermon that was delivered with anger and resentment and as little words as possible, as little enticing people to join in. God used it to bring about transformation, change. <clears throat> and the good news is that God speaks through all of us, whether you have a preaching format or you're in conversation and you give eight words to somebody. God is speaking through you and maybe those are the words they need to hear at that time. So, Jonah had delivered his sermon. Was he happy about it? Was he happy to see change and see things that were happening? Nah. First, the first verses of chapter 4 that follow. But to Jonah, this seemed wrong when he saw that God wasn't going to bring about judgment and punishment. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Hmm. He knew God was a God of compassion, a God of mercy. He didn't want to help the Assyrians he wanted God to destroy them, to punish them. And after he said his words and he saw this great, these great things happening, people's lives being changed, he was angry. And he went outside the city and pouted it and got angry at God and gets into a dialogue with God about why are you saving these people? And God is questioning his sense of judgment of him. I want to leave you at verse 11. This is how the story ends. After Jonah and God get into this back and forth, God finally says, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? 
the end. That's how this story ends. Now you see why we want to focus on the first couple of chapters, the great story with the whale and all that. We can relate to that, can't we? But can't we also relate, even though we don't want to acknowledge it, to this idea that there's times that we want to see vengeance being done on people? We want to see people pay the price for their actions. That we realize that God is a God of compassion and of mercy. And sometimes we can't get it. It bothers us. And we don't know what to do, know what to do with it. That is the mystery of grace. Grace is that unconditional love and acceptance that Christ offers us. And here we're seeing that the mystery of grace is one that we sometimes struggle with because we don't always want to share that with everybody, just the people we like or the people we think it's okay to receive it, right? Does it mean that There are going to be times then that we may not see people and situations in the same light of mercy and compassion as God. Think about it. Are there times when you can't see past vengeance or resentment or frustration? Can you think of a time when you're reluctant to see grace being given towards certain people? I know um, there was a time, my very first appointment, when I had just come out of seminary. You're always in seminary, everybody's really nervous waiting for the calls from your, your bishop or your DS of where you're going for that first appointment. And I finally got my call, and it was from a DS I was friends with. And I was excited to be offered to be an associate at a large church in, near Orlando. I was really excited to be going home, in all honesty. It was going to be great for my son to be back around family. But I have to tell you, when you're in seminary, you get on fire, and I wanted to go to that place where I was just going to change the world in Jesus' name, make a big difference, turn people's lives upside down, you know, all that. And this was a wealthy church. People were wealthy, they were comfortable, they had jobs. It wasn't a place where people struggled with daily living. The church had money, and I was like, Man, I need to go out in the, in the fields, in the, in the hard places. I was a little frustrated with that. And, but I went, to, and it was a great placement. It was where I needed to be. It was where I needed to learn from. And one of the things I learned that no much matter what facade people put, that church had some of the loneliest and emptiest people that I have seen anywhere in my ministry. That the facade of wealth and being comfortable covered up a lot of pain. So I learned that where I needed to be, where God needed me to be, I had to say yes to. We all love to follow God when it's easy, don't we? When we are called to do something that we like doing or it's with people that we like to be around. We don't want to reach out to the Assyrians in our life, do we? Who are the Assyrians for you? The people maybe that have caused you pain the people that you don't agree with, the people that, that just seem to be using power in the wrong way. 
Who are the Assyrians in your life? Do you ever get angry when you see mercy being given to somebody we don't think deserves it? Do you get resentful? The message that is here is that, and that God is trying to tell Jonah is that God's mercy comes to all people. And in parentheses, whether we like it or not. Let's admit it. Sometimes we find a little sense of gratification when we see somebody that has hurt us or, or that we don't agree with getting some sort of retribution, some sort of payback. Because we all think about the statement, what goes around comes around, right? And we keep waiting for the goes around to come around so we can see it and can enjoy it. But that's not really how it always works. God's mercy comes to all people. All people. And even when we have been hurt and we have resentment and, and all sorts of things, God's not going to necessarily take that into consideration. I remember hearing from some it's like letting somebody you despise live rent-free in your mind. Hanging on to resentment is like letting somebody you despise live rent-free in your mind. Can you relate to that? God is showing compassion for Jonah through Jonah's anger and his struggle with seeing the good things happening to Nineveh. But ultimately, ultimately, even when he was showing compassion to Jonah, the bottom line is he said to Jonah, it's not up to you and what you think. It is who I am. The God that we worship and love is a God of compassion and mercy for all. We love this God of power and mercy because it's a key for each one of us of knowing who God is. And we don't understand it. Grace is a mystery. The mercy that is given out to others is a mystery. The good news for us is God sent an embodied messenger, an embodied proclamation to us through Jesus Christ to remind each one of us of that compassion and mercy that is given to all of us because none of us deserved and earned the passion compassion and love that was given to us by Jesus on the cross. Amen? Not one of us. Jesus reminds us that we don't deserve mercy and compassion, but yet it's given to us in the same way, and we're called to try to share it with others. It's really hard it's really hard, especially when we can't celebrate or agree. And it doesn't mean that we have to, to bend over backwards, but sometimes we just have to recognize that God's mercy and compassion is going on in spite of us. Being an active Christian takes courage. And this is one of those things when we accept that mystery of grace given to others that we don't like or think deserve it. It takes courage for us. 
And I want you to think about that this week, what that means. As you're going through your day-to-day -day life, and when you hear things about people you don't like or things happening, start thinking about that mystery of grace and compassion that God gives to all. <clears throat> the best, best outcome of any sermon is that transformation happens whether we like it or not. God is compassionate and merciful. And I hope you believe that. Are you part, are you willing to be part of this whole idea of the mystery of grace? Living it, even in a place where you don't agree with all that receive it. And you have to struggle sometimes to say, okay, okay. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we like it when everything goes our way and we're around the people that we like and we see mercy and compassion happening to, to those people we can cheer for. But there are many times that we see mercy and compassion happening to people that we don't like, that we resent, and we don't understand it. We're like Jonah, struggling to figure it out. And yet you are patient with us reminding us that in the same way that you are merciful to us. Give us courage, Lord, to be your people, to follow you, even when it's not easy. Amen. Will you stand in closing with me? How different that story of Jonah would have been if he would have drew nearer to God instead of running the other way, right? close to you never let me go I lay it all down again to hear you say it I'm your friend you are my desire no one else will do Nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you
So as we go out this week, think, keep that image of, that we started with of God's wings <clears throat> over us, of God being there with us, even when we are pushing away even when we're asked to do something that we don't agree with, to talk to people we don't like, even when we see God's mercy and compassion being shared, and we're like, oh, not them. Remember that God's mercy and passion is being shared with us. And maybe somebody else is going, oh, not them. Pull on the courage, pull on the hope and the promise of Jesus Christ. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. And all God's people everywhere said, Amen. Amen. No.